Tonight, a nation in mourning, the families that lost everything, the shooter's final days, and a governor confronted live on TV. 19 students and two teachers dead after that gunman opened fire at Robb Elementary. The massacre, the second deadliest school shooting in American history. More than a dozen victims still recovering in the hospital as chilling new details of the shocking rampage come to light. What the 18-year-old gunman posted on Facebook just moments before the shooting and what his shocked family revealed to us tonight as police desperately search for a motive. Plus, remembering the victim, stories of heroism emerging as we learn more about the 21 people killed, many of them just 10 years old, students in the same classroom. One of their teachers reportedly shielding her students when she was shot dead. Their devastated families remembering the lives cut tragically short tonight. Fiery confrontation, Beto O'Rourke interrupting Texas Governor Greg Abbott as he delivered an update on the shooting. The Democratic candidate for governor accusing his opponent of doing nothing to stop gun violence and escorted out of the auditorium in Washington, President Biden pleading with Congress to take action. Will any of it be enough to spark change? The other major news tonight, Trump's primary failure. Georgia voters rejecting candidates backed by the former president could this be a sign of a shift in the Republican Party as we head into the midterms? Plus, Moss takes the stand. What Kate Moss revealed about injuries she sustained while dating Johnny Depp and when the high-profile defamation case could be handed over to the jury. And the cyclist murder manhunt, the new surveillance video from the Austin airport where police say the woman accused of killing a fellow elite biker may have been heading. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We are live tonight from Uvalde, Texas, a community torn apart by yet another senseless act of gun violence. The heartbreak, the grief and the tears that we have seen here are all tragically familiar, yet somehow still so deeply impossible to comprehend. Yesterday at the Robb Elementary School just behind me, a gunman opened fire, killing 19 students and two teachers all in a single classroom. There are some of the faces you can see how young so many of them were so full of life. Now, this small town of just over 15,000 people, a majority of them Latino, families searching for answers, clinging to each other in their darkest moments. Authorities searching for answers to the governor, reading chilling threats the shooter posted to social media just moments before the deadly rampage. The gunman's family now speaking out as well, what they revealed to us about the teen's past in just moments. We will bring you all of that, plus reaction from the president tonight and lawmakers across the country as the debate over guns is reignited once more. But we begin tonight with the agony right here in Texas, and NBC nightly news anchor Lester Holt leads us off. Tonight, amid the unbearable shock and sorrow here, the disbelief that this small Texas town could be the target for this kind of horror. 19 elementary school students, two teachers, all gunned down on the last week of school. I consider this person to have been pure evil. You know, to get closer, we got fired. Officials say the rampage began around 11 a.m. Tuesday when the suspect posted on Facebook he was going to shoot his 66-year-old grandmother, who he lived with inside this home. She survived, went to a neighbor to call police, while authorities say he took off in her truck, posting on Facebook, I shot my grandmother, and around 11.15 a.m., I'm going to shoot an elementary school. By 11.32, he was at Robb Elementary, where police say he crashed the truck. There was a brave, consolidated independent school district resource officer that approached him, engaged him, and at that time, there was not, gunfire was not exchanged. The suspect was then able to go inside the school with a backpack and an AR-15 rifle. He went down the hallway, turned right, then turned left, and there was two classrooms that were adjoining, and that's where the, the carnage began. Officials say he locked the door, then opened fire. <laughs> This man had just brought flowers to his wife, a teacher. The minute I got in my pickup, I heard a couple of shots, and then immediately the police were there. The suspect was shot and killed by a responding Border Patrol officer. 
Police say the suspect is Salvador Ramos, who recently turned 18, the legal age to buy a gun in Texas, and had just bought his weapons. Officials say he had dropped out of Uvalde High School, was unemployed, and had no criminal history. Today, we spoke with the family of fourth grader Aurelia Santos, who was still clutching her teddy bear. Did you hear the shooting? Two times, yes. They sounded like bangs, but then our teacher kept saying, no, they're just fireworks. So we knew they weren't fireworks, so everyone was panicking. My friend Michael, he was nearby the window where, and he saw him, so he he kept mouthing whatever the teacher was up, and someone got shot. That's a lot for 10-year-olds to deal with. That's a lot for any of us to deal with. How are you doing today? I'm doing better. And you got to talk to someone today? Yeah. Her parents brought her in for counseling. You know she knew many of the victims. Aurelia knows some of those kids? Very, very many. She's grown up with them. We're a small town. Meanwhile, emotional scenes with parents desperate for news about their kids. As tonight, we're learning more about the heartbreaking toll here. Ten-year-old Amory Jo Garza, seen beaming as she was named the honor roll during the school's awards day, just hours before she was gunned down in her classroom. Her grandmother said she was shot as she was calling 911. Among the other victims identified tonight, Annabelle Rodriguez, Eliana Torres, Jose Flores, Javier Lopez, Rogelio Torres, Uzia Garcia, Lexi Rubio, Ellie Garcia, Jacqueline Cesares, Jace Luevanos, and Jaila Seguero. And teachers Irma Garcia and Eva Morales, a 17-year veteran of Uvalde schools. I've worked for this district for 30 years and never thought I would be sitting in front of you doing this today. But please pray for our teachers, pray for our community, and we will move forward. All of America praying for this community. Lester mentioning those 21 victims, including 19 children. Tonight, we're learning more about who they were, what they loved, most of them just looking forward to the end of the school year, scheduled for tomorrow. Morgan Chesky has their stories. Tonight, they are the faces breaking hearts nationwide and bringing the small town of Uvalde to its knees. 19 children now identified and two beloved teachers gunned down in an elementary school. Authorities confirming all of them were inside a single classroom, led by Irma Garcia, and Ava Morales, friends and co-teachers for the past five years. Garcia, a Uvalde veteran, molding young minds for the last 23 years. And Aunt telling the New York Times she was an avid hiker and the fun of the party. A relative calling Morales a hero, citing law enforcement who told him she was seen using her body to shield her kids from the attacker. The young lives cut short, offering a glimpse of bright futures. Eliana Torres, a student and athlete, who was never far from a softball field. There was fourth grader Uzziah Garcia, third grader Annabel Guadalupe Rodriguez, killed in the same classroom as her cousin, 10-year-old Xavier Lopez, a fourth grader, Jackie Cazares, Alicia Ramirez, Rogelio Torres, and Eli Garcia. Many showing up to school Tuesday, dressed to impress as part of a school-wide footloose and fancy day. And then, there's Amari Jo Garza, captured here in her last known photo, just hours before the shooting, proud to show off her honor roll certificate. Her grandmother telling the Daily Beast she was shot while trying to call 911. The loss of 10-year-old Jose Flores Jr. prompting his uncle to pin this tribute, writing, I still can't believe this happened. My heart is broken. I'm going to miss you so much. Rest in paradise, my beautiful angel. When you meet a family who's just lost a child, what do you even say? Yes, you don't say almost anything. It's just to embrace them. Tonight, with a massive investigation underway and questions that may never be answered, a community clings to the faces and names of those loved and lost. It is a good question, Morgan. What can you say to those families? Morgan Chesky joins us now from the Reunification Center, where so many parents gathered yesterday. Morgan. I said that's probably the saddest place in America right now. 
Yeah, Tom, you're absolutely right. And the anguish of that waiting game has shifted today to really become just a grieving center. We know that counselors came in here today and were able to meet with staff from Robb Elementary School all day long. They will remain here at this site for the foreseeable future. In the meantime, Uvalde School District says every campus here remains closed and graduation has been canceled. Tom. Morgan Chesky, who has been on this tragedy for us from the get-go. Morgan, we thank you. Through the agony and the grief, a question on everyone's mind is why? Why did this 18-year-old shoot his grandmother and then carry out this heinous massacre? Earlier today, I spoke to members of the shooter's family who, like so many across the country, are wondering what happened. Tonight, we're learning more about 18-year-old gunman Salvador Ramos. He grew up in the same town he tore apart alongside the families whose children he murdered during Tuesday's senseless massacre. Anyone who shoots his grandmother in the face has to have evil in his heart. But it is far more evil for someone to gun down little kids. People who knew the shooter describe him as a loner in this small community of about 15,000 people. Nobody knew him, nobody was there with him. He dropped out of a local high school and had worked at a fast food restaurant. He posted photos of guns on social media, but law enforcement says he has no known criminal history and no record of mental illness. Until recently, the shooter lived with his mother and her boyfriend, Juan Manuel Alvarez. So I didn't know you could, you could be capable of doing something like that. It's hard, man. Alvarez says the gunman was bullied as a child, would often keep to himself and avoided conversation. He says two months ago the teen moved out after getting into a fight with his mother over the Wi-Fi. That's when he moved into this house with his grandparents. His grandfather spoke with reporters today. Could you give us any insight into his Not state really. of mind? What, when's the last time you spoke to him? Uh, I speak to him daily, but yeah. you know he had guns in the house? I didn't know. Those guns were two AR-15 rifles, legally purchased shortly after he turned 18. He used one in Tuesday's horrific shooting. The other was found on the ground outside of his grandmother's truck, which he had crashed in a ditch near the school. His family members say they never thought he could do this. I spoke with his aunt, Shelby, who was in disbelief. Do you think your family would like to say to the families of those involved? For everybody involved, I'm sorry, my condolences to everybody. This is something that I wouldn't wish upon anybody. Do you have any idea why he flipped? See, everybody has their own, like I said, their own perspective of everything going on. Nobody knows what he, everybody holds. Everybody holds things inside. People go through things and nobody understands. She says and she has no idea why he targeted this elementary school. This shouldn't have happened like this. And I'm sorry to all the families, like, my heart aches. I have babies. My son goes to the same school. Like, my heart hurts for everyone right now. For more on those guns purchased by the alleged gunmen, I want to turn to NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams. Pete, I know you and the investigative team have a lot of new reporting on this angle. Well, Tom, law enforcement officials say Salvador Ramos bought two AR-15 style weapons and several hundred rounds of ammunition just last week. Within a few days after he turned 18, he also posted a picture of the weapons on social media. We estimate the total cost at around $3,500. Each of those rifles has a 30-round magazine or clip. And then when he entered the school yesterday, investigators say he was carrying one of them. The other was found on the ground near the pickup truck that he was driving when he crashed it into a ditch. Under federal law, the minimum age to buy a handgun is 21, but the minimum age to buy a long gun, meaning a shotgun, a rifle, or one of those AR-15 style weapons is 18. So Texas authorities say Ramos bought those weapons legally. The Texas governor, Greg Abbott, was asked today about that. The ability of an 18-year-old to uh, buy a long gun has uh, been in place uh, in the state of Texas for more than 60 years. Uh, and think about during the time over the course of that 60 years, we have not had episodes like this. And why, why is it that for the majority of those 60 years, we did not have school shootings? And why is it that we do now? The reality is, I don't know the answer to that question. 
A federal law passed in 1968 set that minimum age for buying a long gun at 18, and advocates of gun control say back then that meant hunting rifles because AR-15 style weapons didn't become popular until the late 80s, early 90s. So they say it makes no sense to allow the sale of those weapons at 18, but not handguns until 21. But Governor Abbott said today California, New York, and Chicago all have strict gun laws, but still have a problem with gun violence, Tom. Pete Williams for us tonight. Pete, thank you for that. Now to the president's response amid growing calls to action to curb gun violence. President Biden saying he's, quote, sick and tired of what's going on. The first lady telling reporters today, of course, they'll travel to Texas. This after a heated confrontation at Governor Abbott's news conference today. NBC News chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker has the latest. Emotions boiling over in Texas today during a press conference by Texas Governor Greg Abbott and law enforcement. Democrat Beto O'Rourke, who's running against Abbott, barging in to confront him. This is totally predictable. Officials with Abbott shouted back at O'Rourke, demanding he leave. You're out of line and an embarrassment. Hey, I can't believe you're a sick son of a bitch that would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. Security escorted O'Rourke outside. Later, O'Rourke defending his actions. Now is the time to stop the next shooting. Um, right after Santa Fe High School was the time to stop the next shooting. Right after El Paso was the time to stop the next shooting. In June, Governor this? Abbott signed Texas seven laws aimed at easing fight. gun restrictions, Every including one that allows law-abiding Texans 21 or older to carry a handgun in public without a license. Federal law already allows 18-year-olds to buy the type of long gun the shooter used. Abbott today defending is, loosening restrictions. There are, quote, real gun laws in Chicago. I hate to say this, but there are more people who were shot every weekend in Chicago than there are in schools in Texas. The political clash in Texas echoing the national debate over guns. After making an impassioned speech for new gun restrictions overnight, President Biden doubling down today. I'm just sick and tired. Where's the backbone? Where's the courage? to stand up to a very powerful lobby. But while Democrats control Congress, they do not appear to have the votes to pass new laws right now. When you have 18-year-olds who can't buy a beer, but they can buy a, a weapon in the state of Texas, that's a problem. That's an issue of gun ownership. Many Republicans arguing the answer is more resources for mental health and beefing up security at schools. I can't assure the American people there's any law we can pass to stop this shooting. But there has only been inaction when it comes to the issue of mass shootings. In 2004, the federal ban on assault weapons expired. Mr. Biden repeatedly called for it to be reimposed. In 2013, after the Sandy Hook massacre, Congress came close to passing widely supported expanded background checks, but failed to do so amid opposition from Republicans and red state Democrats. And in 2019, the Trump administration banned bump stocks, devices which increased the rate of fire for semi-automatic weapons, a move that had limited impact. And with that, Kristen Welker joins us now from the White House. Kristen, so many asking the question about the NRA convention. It's set to happen in Houston this weekend, and a lot of top Republicans are expected to attend, including former President Trump and the governor of this state, Governor Abbott. Has anyone backed out yet? Well, you're absolutely right, Tom. There is a lot of focus on that annual convention on Friday in Houston. Some Republicans have already bowed out, including Texas Senator John Cornyn, citing personal reasons. Texas Congressman Dan Crenshaw said he can no longer attend because he'll be in Ukraine. That's according to his office. Both lawmakers saying they told the NRA about their schedule changes before yesterday's shooting. Meanwhile, you asked about former President Trump. He said he will attend, saying now is not the time for politicians and partisanship. As for Governor Abbott, he did not commit to attending, telling reporters today he is living moment by moment right now. Tom.
All eyes will be on that NRA convention. All right, Kristen, we thank you for that. As President Biden calls for action, Congress still remains deeply divided on a path forward. Garrett Haight covers Congress for us. He joins us now here on Top Story. So, Garrett, what is the path forward for Democrats on this? It's narrow if it exists at all. There's a bipartisan background check bill that passed the House that's been sitting in the Senate for more than a year now. I don't see that moving. There aren't the 10 Republican votes that are necessary to pass it. But what the conversation has been on the Hill today and where there may be a narrow path to 60 votes is on red flag laws, extreme risk laws that would allow a judge and in some cases a doctor to intervene and take weapons away from people who might be too mentally unwell to have them. It's not even close to everything that gun safety advocates want, but because there are laws that have been successful in red states like Florida and Indiana, some Republicans have embraced it. Maybe there's a possibility you could get to 60 votes there, but you know, the people have been waiting for the federal government to act on this issue since we started learning about school shootings around Columbine, and, and we've not seen anything. You know, Garrett, as I listen to you, I'm reminded of some of your reporting from a couple of weeks ago on, on abortion and how you mm -hmm. called Democrats out for basically being caught flat-footed. This, this is a horrific incident. Do you think this is going to change anything? What's your sense on the atmosphere in Congress right now? The unfortunate reality is it might take something like this to change anything. I mean, for example, there was major discussion about background checks after Sandy Hook. That was, you know, something that moved Congress, although not far enough. But every of these mass shootings that we've covered, whether it be the shooting in El Paso a couple of years ago, the shooting in Buffalo last week, hasn't even created a conversation. This has done that. It's an incredibly low bar, but it is a start. The person I'm watching, Texas senior Senator John Cornyn. He's been the Republican involved with Democrats on these negotiations. He left here today without talking to reporters. He's pulled out of the NRA convention on Friday. If he decides he wants to engage, I think that's a sign there may be something real here. Finally, since I have you here, you, you are from Texas. This is your home state. You cover politics for us. That moment with Beto O'Rourke, will that resonate with voters across the state? Because it, it clearly was a shocking moment. It'll resonate with Democrats, certainly. I think there he reflected what I hear from a lot of people, uh, Democrats in this state, where they want to shout at their TVs when they hear Governor Abbott talk about you know, school shootings without talking about the shooting part of it. Whether he can get cross appeal, whether he can get Republican voters has always been a challenge for O'Rourke. But he's always believed that there are enough non-voters in Texas, people who just think the, poli the, po the process doesn't apply to them, their votes don't matter. That if he can get those people fired up, that's a path to make a difference. This is the kind of thing that could potentially get their attention. Republican said he was out of line, that it was too soon for this. What will Texans think? I think there are some Texans who will think after a shooting it's too late for something like this. I'm sure there will be people who feel like what he did today was clownish. But again, there is a, a, a group of Texans who have wanted to support policies like what O'Rourke puts in place that haven't felt like they had a voice in Texas because the state's been dominated by Republicans for so long. They're cheering him on to them. Still ahead, we continue our coverage from Uvalde, Texas. Parents across the country now questioning if their own children are safe at school. How some teachers are addressing the tragedy inside of the classroom. Plus, red flag laws, what are they? How to report if you're concerned about someone who owns firearms. And in other news, Kate Moss taking the stand in Johnny Depp's defamation trial against Amber Heard. What the former supermodel said about allegations, Depp pushed her down the staircase. We'll be right back. And we are back now live from Uvalde, Texas, at the site of another mass shooting, this time at an elementary school. And parents across the country are fearing for the safety of their own children, many even keeping their kids home from school. NBC's Stephanie Gosk with a look at how many are feeling tonight. This morning, with the horror of another school shooting on their minds, parents had to wake up and do what they normally do on a Wednesday, get their kids out the door for school. Wondering how I was going to tell my children about what they were going to hear in school and on the news today and how to not frighten them. They got on the bus and I sat here and cried, wondering if they'll come home. We lingered a bit longer at home, hugged a bit tighter at drop off. And after I made sure they were inside, sat in my car and prayed a little more specifically for their safe return to my arms tonight. I smelled his head and I felt his cheek next to mine. And I thought, how lucky am I that I get to do that this morning when so many families in Texas don't? And how unlucky am I that I live in a country that allows this to keep happening? I'm panicking, I'm scared. I'm double thinking myself, should I send them or should I not? I tell myself that 
my two kids, Clara and Charlie, are two of tens of millions, and today probably won't be the day I win the worst lottery that there ever was. Teacher Matt Dix also pledges this to his students. I will stand between you and whatever bad thing has come into our school. One mom in Arkansas couldn't even send her son to school today. They did place extra police officers around the campuses today, but I still felt more comfortable keeping him home with me. In some places, the fear runs even deeper because they were victims of a school shooting themselves, like in Parkland, Florida. It jogs up the memories of our own tragedy and it creates a level of fear and uncertainty in our communities. And then there are the parents in Uvalde itself. My five-year-old did go to school and having to explain to him why he had to hide under his desk for half of the day is very hard. He can't comprehend it. Um, he just said that he was happy that him and his, his best friend Lewis were safe. Being safe at school is something kids and their parents should be able to take for granted. But they don't. Not in this country. Not anymore. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. We thank Stephanie for that. For more on those red flag laws we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, you may remember. And how to report if you're concerned about someone. I want to bring in retired ATF special agent in charge and NBC News law enforcement analyst Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So I want to zoom out here, right, and look big picture at the status of red flag laws in the U.S. We've got a map I want to show you and show our viewers. Here are the 19 states that allow loved ones or police to petition courts to confiscate firearms from people who might be at risk of harming themselves or others. But people who are concerned about someone may not know how to use these laws. If you're concerned about someone who owns firearms, what's the process? What should you do first? The first step is to call the local police and tell them the situation. If it's a student, you call the school and the school resource officer, which is a police officer or deputy sheriff. Outline the problem. If you don't feel like you're getting the response you want, Call and get a sergeant, get a lieutenant, don't stop at the first call, and lay out the problem and get some action for your problem. Jim, you know, I have to ask you, there are guards at schools all across this country. We remember what happened in Parkland with Scott Peterson, of course, did not engage or stop that shooter. And then here we learned today that there was a school guard as well, and that school guard wasn't able to stop the carnage here. So my question to you is, do you have faith in, in the men and women that are being paid to protect these schools? I have faith in them, Tom, but when you have a guy with a military rifle, even if he's going against two or three officers with handguns, he's already winning. I mean, he has a rifle that shoot rounds of 3,000 feet per second. They'll go through the officer's vest, through the officer, and out the back of the vest. They're extremely accurate. This guy had an Ecotech sight on there. Uh, they're just no match for those rifles. Uh, so unless they're walking around the halls with rifles, uh, it's going to be tough. So uh, it, it's really an outmatched uh, gun battle until more patrolmen get there with tactical rifles. An interesting perspective when someone comes on to school grounds with an AR-15 style rifle. Jim Cavanaugh, we appreciate your analysis tonight here on Top Story. When we come back, the fugitive on the run, the new surveillance video showing the woman accused of murdering a professional cyclist at an airport where authorities believe she is now. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories news feed and an update in the search for a Texas fugitive accused of murdering an elite cyclist. Authorities releasing new surveillance video showing 34-year-old Caitlin Marie Armstrong at Austin's International Airport on May 14th. You see her there just three days after the alleged killing. Police say she boarded a flight to New York. She's accused of fatally shooting Anna Mariah Wilson after learning the cyclist had been involved with her boyfriend. The Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial defamation trial is barreling towards a close, but not before one final day of star-studded testimony. Depp taking the stand for a second time, the actor adamantly denying claims he sexually or physically abused his ex-wife. Supermodel Kate Moss also testifying over Zoom Responding to allegations, Depp pushed her down the stairs while they were dating in the 90s. Take a listen. We were leaving the room, and Johnny left the room before I did, and there had been a rainstorm. And as I left the room, I slid down the stairs, 
and I hurt my back. Did Mr. Depp push you in any way down the stairs? No. Depp is suing her for defamation after she described herself as a domestic abuse survivor in a Washington Post op-ed. The case expected to head to the jury this week. And you may remember we told you about a recall earlier this week of Jif peanut butter, is, and that's expanding. Several retailers across the country now pulling dozens of products from snack packs to fudge. The peanut butter is recalled over possible salmonella contamination. At least 14 illnesses across a dozen states have been reported, but the CDC estimates the number is much, much higher. All right, next tonight, as a tragedy unfolded in Texas, voters went to the polls for high-stakes primary elections in several states. Von Hilliard has the results, including setbacks for some of the candidates endorsed by former President Trump. Voters in Georgia on Tuesday decisively rejecting Donald Trump's endorsed candidates, the first major roadblocks to his efforts to maintain control of today's Republican Party. Team Kemp has always been built from the grassroots up. Governor Brian Kemp, who drew Trump's rage after certifying Joe Biden's 2020 win, handily defeated Trump-backed challenger David Perdue, who just days earlier tried to downplay his pending loss. Tuesday, but I can't damn tell you, we're not down 30 points. Instead, he lost by 50 points. Now, Kemp will square off with Democrat Stacey Abrams in a 2018 rematch. Today is the beginning of the next phase of this campaign. Georgia's Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and Attorney General Chris Carr, also to the chagrin of Trump, won their races outright. The vast majority of Georgians are looking for honest people for elected office. Someone who would do their job Follow the law. And see you across the state, Alabama. Next door, Congressman Mo Brooks is heading to Alabama's U.S. Senate runoff, rising from his thought to be political ashes after Trump dropped his endorsement earlier this spring. No one has 100% influence. Another sign that Republicans who have drawn Trump's scorn can still thrive, though in Arkansas, Trump's former White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, securing the GOP's nomination for governor. You know, when I worked at the White House, nobody ever cheered when I went up to the podium, so <laughs> this is different. And in Texas, George P. Bush losing his primary for attorney general, marking an end to the Bush family dynasty, 70 years after patriarch Prescott Bush first entered public office. And Tom, we've got to note those U.S. Senate races. Herschel Walker, the Georgia football legend, ran away on Tuesday in the U.S. Senate primary in Georgia. He'll face Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and was expected to be a marquee matchup this November. And we've also got a note in Pennsylvania this afternoon. They formally began the recount in that U.S. Senate GOP primary. Presently, Mehmet Oz holds a lead of less than 1,000 votes over David McCormick. Tom? That razor-thin lead there. All right, Vaughn Hilliard for us. Vaughn, thank you. To the latest on the baby formula shortage now, executives from major formula manufacturers and the FDA on Capitol Hill today grilled by lawmakers on how the crisis managed to get to this point. Jolyn Kent has the story. Anger over the formula shortage crisis and recall erupting once again on Capitol Hill today. You owe an apology to the parents of children who got sick and possibly a couple that have died. The House Oversight Committee calling executives from three major formula manufacturers to face the public, including Abbott. Their Michigan plant was closed in February and Abbott issued a voluntary recall over contamination concerns after four babies got sick, including two who died. We are deeply deeply sorry. The company has denied its formula is linked to the illnesses. What I don't understand is why Abbott didn't immediately address these issues without having to be told to by the FDA or anybody else. Representative, we prioritize safety and compliance in our plants and we're committed to, to, to doing so and getting better coming out of this Event. Madam Chairman, for the record, I'm not satisfied with the witness's answers. FDA Commissioner Robert Califf detailing disturbing conditions inside the Abbott facility. Let's say you had a next door neighbor who had uh, leaks in the roof. Um, they didn't wash their hands. They had bacteria growing all over the kitchen. You walked in and there was standing water on the counters and the floor. You probably wouldn't want your infant eating in that kitchen. The commissioner testified that Abbott has repaired the leaking roof and replaced the floor. 
The FDA also facing blowback for acting too slowly after receiving a whistleblower complaint last October, but the plant didn't close till months later. How does that happen? How can that possibly happen? Well, let me just point out that um, the, the complaint was received. It was logged in right away. There were some medical issues that delayed it. We're on record as saying it took too long. The outrage spilling over as a second plane carrying emergency formula landed at Dulles International Airport, carrying 114 pallets of Gerber Good Start hypoallergenic formula to be trucked to Pennsylvania, ready to hit store shelves this weekend. I'm here today to say to parents, you aren't alone. Abbott says it plans to restart production at its closed plant on Saturday, June 4th, with formula hitting shelves around June 20th. But if you listen to the hearing as we did today, you'll see that that date is a moving target. Tom. Joe Link Kent for us. Joe, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with the war in Ukraine, which has now entered its fourth month. Russia now focusing on a sliver of land in the eastern Donbass region, Heavy shelling knocking out water and electrical supplies to several small cities with residents now living in underground shelters. And violent protests breaking out in the Philippines as the country elected a new president. Video shows riot police using water cannons on a crowd. The demonstrators trying to make their way to the congressional building. Take a look at that as boats were being counted. The winner, Fernand Marcos Jr., son of the country's former dictator, will take office on June 30th. All right, we head now to the Americas, the White House trying to avoid a political blunder as world leaders consider boycotting a meeting of American nations meant to promote unity. Priscilla Thompson takes a look at the root of this tension and what it could mean for the U.S. influence in the region. Tonight, summit snub. Leaders of countries in Latin America consider boycotting the Summit of the Americas after U.S. officials announced Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua likely won't be invited. No nos interesa estar en esa cumbre. No nos interesa. The summit, which is being hosted by the U.S. in Los Angeles next month, intended to unify the Americas, now fueling fractures. Tienen que participar todos los países, todos los pueblos de América, que nadie debe excluir a nadie. Mexico's president and a vital U.S. partner amid soaring migration saying no country should be excluded and that if they are, he won't attend. Si nos invita a todos, va a ir una representación del gobierno de México Pero no iría yo. Within days, the president of Bolivia made a similar announcement, followed by Honduras and several Caribbean nations. Leaders of Brazil and Guatemala also declining the invitation at the moment for other reasons. In the case of the Caribbean, these are small island countries that have very close relations with Cuba. The president of Mexico, President López Obrador, is very friendly with Cuba, and he uh, just doesn't think that uh, Cuba should be excluded just because it's a dictatorship. What would it mean if the U.S. were to invite these countries when the Biden administration has said that they are only inviting Democratic leaders and given the sort of history of human rights issues in some of these countries? It would be uh, somewhat contradictory or inconsistent. President Biden has insisted on the need for countries respecting human rights. The Biden administration now scrambling to save the summit, a State Department official accusing Cuba of portraying the White House as the, quote, bad guy. They want the press on us not inviting them to the summit or not. Well, you know what? Stop repressing your people. Meanwhile, Biden's special advisor for the summit, Chris Dodd, spoke with the president of Mexico last week. As First Lady Jill Biden visited Ecuador, Panama, and Costa Rica, part of a high-stakes tour of Latin America. This with less than two weeks until the summit, a monumental return to U.S. soil since the inaugural was held in 1994. Good morning. We have just completed the first working session of our summit. Even then, Cuba wasn't invited. Since then, the summit has been held by a different country every three years. On multiple occasions, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba all invited. What does all this say about the U.S.'s position in Latin America in this moment? What's clear is that the time when the United States called the summit and everybody came, it's not happening with President Biden today. uh, And it probably will not happen again with anybody because U.S. ascendancy in Latin America 
is no longer what it was. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, New York. And when we come back, we continue our live coverage of this deadly elementary school massacre here in Texas. A survivor of the Parkland school shooting joins Top Story Live, her perspective on the tragedy and how to move forward, if you can, from here. Stay with us. And welcome back. As survivors of the Uvalde school shooting try to come to grips with yesterday's tragedy, many of them may be wondering, what's next? Sari Kaufman joins us now. She's a survivor of the Parkland High School shooting and a volunteer leader with Students Demand Action. Sari, thank you so much for coming on Top Story tonight. I know that these mass shootings can re-traumatize and be very difficult for survivors like yourself. What will the next few days and weeks be like for the families of the victims and the survivors? Yeah, it's really difficult seeing another school shooting like this, especially when we're talking about elementary school students. And what the public needs to understand that it's not just going to be tomorrow or the next day or when these elementary school students have to go to funerals for their friends. It's going to be the rest of their lives that they're going to have to deal with this trauma with the PTSD. And, you know, as we have more and more school shootings and also everyday gun violence, we need to remember that it's not just the day or the news cycle that these students are affected. It's going to be the rest of their lives. Um, and lawmakers need to be able to do something about that. It's an important point. Sari, so many of us are sad, so many of us are angry, but, but I have to think the students of Parkland have to be particularly angry today. There was a lot of momentum and hope that real change was possible. What do you and your fellow Parkland survivors want to see now? Yeah, it's extremely frustrating, honestly angering to see four years after Parkland and so many years after Sandy Hook to then see another shooting. And I still do have hope. After Parkland, you saw Florida, which no one thought would happen, pass a red flag law. So Texas can do the same thing, even with a Republican governor. And we need to continue to put pressure on these Republicans. And on the federal level, you know, there are so many different approaches. You see Democrats willing to compromise. It's the Republicans who have to come forward and realize that they're continuing to put politics over these children's lives. And, you know, if it happens in their community, are they going to regret that they continue to put politics over even their own kids' lives? And I think once people see that, you know, it's not just an abstract event and, oh, it can only happen in a specific community. This can happen to anyone. And, you know, once people realize that, hopefully we'll see some action, at least on the federal level, in the next few days. Sari, if I can ask you to be frank, but obviously remember you're on live television. What, what were the texts, the phone calls, and the emails like between you and your, your Parkland friends yesterday when the news was coming in and then we learned that 19 school children had died? There's a lot of cynicism. I think after four years, especially because we've raised our voices, we've shared our stories, we've you know, shared our emotions with this whole country, and then for it to happen again, um, I think most of us felt let down and pessimistic, honestly, just about our politics, especially as young people who try to be hopeful. Um, you know, now, after 24 hours, I, I do still remain hopeful. I think that change can happen, and we need to continue to stay hopeful, because the only way that this can happen is if we put pressure on these lawmakers um, and say that this issue will matter, especially in the elections. Sari Kaufman, a Parkland survivor, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. Still ahead, a final note from here in Texas, the heroes who rushed in and risked their lives to stop the gunmen, their incredible stories of bravery. When we come back, stay with us. And we are back now with a live look at the entrance to Robb Elementary School and the growing makeshift memorial as the Texas Rangers keep guard over this school where so much tragedy occurred. And tonight, the heroes in Uvalde, Texas, their bravery and sacrifices. Here's Gabe Gutierrez with more. Tonight, the law enforcement officers who stopped the gunmen in Uvalde are being hailed as heroes. You don't mess with our kids. One of them, an unidentified agent with Customs and Border Protection who fired the fatal shot. The agent was wounded but survived. Law enforcement officials did what they do. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives. 
The gunman, armed with a rifle, was first confronted by a school district police officer outside the school. He was shot and wounded. Then the gunman barricaded himself inside a classroom. They breached the classroom door, they went in, they engaged Ramos and killed him at the scene. Authorities say the shooter wore a tactical vest with no armor plate inside. The ATF says the shooter used it to carry at least seven 30-round magazines. Uh, we're really, it's hard to put into words. <clears throat> Vince Di Piazza is Uvalde's city say, manager. Um, we had a school full of kids. They had that much to deal with, too. Figure out really what was going on. Across the U.S., gunmen have become increasingly protected during rampages. At least 21 mass shooters over the last four decades have worn some kind of body armor. Among them, the killers in Aurora, Colorado in 2012, San Bernardino, California in 2015, and Santa Fe, Texas in 2018. In Buffalo this month, a bullet fired by a security guard hit the shooter, but that did not stop the carnage. Today, that retired officer, Aaron Salter Jr., was laid to rest. On one of the darkest days in the history of Buffalo, he made a choice to stand tall. He gave all that he had for all that he believed in, protecting and saving lives. It's illegal under federal law for a convicted felon to buy body armor, but other than that, there are few restrictions. Policing experts say law enforcement officers are increasingly outgunned. This is not a unique tragedy, it's the real tragedy. We're another, we're another town on a long list, and a growing list, apparently. We thank Gabe for that report. I'm Tom Yamas in Uvalde, Texas. Tonight, we leave you with some of the faces of America's latest shooting. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.